Indeed, it is I, JMOLS of JMOLS Gaming, here with another Xenoblade Theory. Let's talk the art book, yeah? Now, I talked about this a little in my previous video on the art book that had come out, and information started to proliferate around the interwebs, oh yes it did. And the one that piqued my curiosity the most was concerning Malos. Yes, Malos, not just Logos. Because as it turns out, it wasn't just Logos in N Sword. It was Malos. And I know that may seem a little bit confusing to some people because, well, J Moles, didn't he die at the end of Xenoblade 2? We're gonna cover that. Now, granted, I don't have the art book, so some of the information from, or that I'm assuming about the art book may be second or third hand, basically me browsing Twitter. But generally speaking, I haven't heard anyone go against these points. So, let's start with a few ground rules here. Okay, so, the information I'm working with is that it was indeed Malo slash Logos, that core crystal was an end sword, and that the scene from Future Redeemed, where they reveal that in the Fist of the End by Matthew, that N has something similar going on with his Sword of the End. And when asked about why in the Q&A of the art book, Takahashi basically said, well, can't tell you yet. Yet being the key word here. Because yet implies that they plan to tell us at some point in the future. And if they want to tell us at some point in the future, there's a couple of ways this can go about. Either we get another game set in Ionios for whatever reason that's explaining this, or a game set in the future where some of the backstory pertains to what happened in Ionios. Perhaps particularly with Malos. Now, let's get into the actual theory. The ground rules are basically established. That's the information pertinent and relevant to this video. Now, I have talked about in the past a couple of theories that I have for the direction of Xenoblade 4, and a couple of them still hold water assuming this theory is true. Because there's some leeway here, yeah? One, the assumption is that Xenoblade 4 is a direct follow-up to Xenoblade 3 and follows after the events of Xenoblade 3 and Future Redeemed on the newly reunited, and in my opinion, freshly interlinked world that, to appease the Xenosaga fans, we'll call Lost Jerusalem slash Earth. I've talked about before why I believe Xenoblade 4 will be a follow-up in some capacity to Xenoblade 3, because the ending of Xenoblade 3 and now Future Redeemed basically screaming at you. And with Takahashi on multiple occasions saying, if you want to kind of get a hint as to where the direction of the series goes in the future, play Xenoblade 3 and the DLC. He's practically telling us to have media literacy here. And I'm fairly confident he reiterated a similar point in the in the art book Q&A. And I talked about before how my main theory for Xenoblade 4 is that it's not a complete reunited world, happy-go-lucky, that it's an interlinked world. Because Future Redeemed showed, quite suspiciously right at the end, that an interlink is possible with more than two people. And it's my belief that the animation and color usage of Future Redeemed's ending is trying to showcase that the two worlds of, let's call them Agnes and Kevis, essentially the worlds of Xenoblade 1 and 2, didn't just fuse back together again and all is well, they in fact interlinked. And one of the key central pivotal story moments or plot devices of an interlink in Xenoblade 3 is that they run their course and that they expire. And if you don't cancel the interlink, then both things essentially collapse in on each other and blow up. Now the headset's coming off for this one, yeah? Because to me, that is an extremely obvious plot device for Xenoblade 4, essentially having it be the counter or the antithesis of Xenoblade 3, where the idea was for us to separate the planets to let them all have their own future and march into the future away from the Endless Now, and in Xenoblade 4, it's about us choosing the future we want. We decide to march into the future in Xenoblade 3, and in Xenoblade 4, we decide the future we want and we pursue it. A reunited world of lost Jerusalem. And I've talked about before how I think the choice of protagonist could be interesting here. And I'm fairly confident I made this theory video before, but for the life of me, I can't remember if I did it in a video, or if I did it in a short, or if I did it on stream. But I'm gonna put it to video here with the final thoughts from the art book. I think there's a massive possibility here that Malos will become a protagonist, if not the main central protagonist, of Xenoblade Chronicles 4. Let me cook. Bear with me. Let me cook. Now, I think there's... Hold on, your boy's gotta learn how to count. One, two, three. Okay, I think there's three main potentialities for the protagonist of Xenoblade 4. I think either it will be Mithra's son, who we have not seen yet. Uh, Mithra's son or daughter, we don't know which. 
It could be a completely new face, a new character that we haven't seen before, or Malos. I want to focus in on the Malos one because I've talked about the other two before. Let's talk about Malos, how this could work, why it could work, and why I honestly starting to think that it is the best choice for Xenoblade 4. Now, who is Malos? He was, insert bad guy for Xenoblade 2, I love him. He's the guy that shouted, INDEED! He was basically one of the Trinity Core processors. Alvis was Ontos, Pyra and Mithra were Numa, Malos was Logos. Oh, I'm stupid, there's another piece to this puzzle. Yeah, so remember there's a theory going around for the longest time that the Trinity Core processor, get it because it's called Trinity, is modeled after the actual Catholicism Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Antos being the Father, Numa being the Holy Spirit, I think that's the order, but the main important one, Malos being the Son, basically being Jesus. I told you this is going to sound insane, let me cook. Because when the pieces fall into place, you may even go, oh, oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Yeah, hold your horses. Indeed. Now, when you think about it, right? Antos being the father, Numa being the Holy Spirit, in some way and in some interpretation, kind of makes sense, right? And I want to give a big shout out to this next point to a member of the community, Milo, because I was unaware of this. On the Trinity Core processor, below their names, there's a Bible verse associated with each one, the Logos one being rather interesting. And essentially, it's Hatred stirreth up strifes, which makes sense, that's essentially Logos' story from Xenoblade 2, however, that's only half the, half the story. But love covereth all sins. Proverbs 10, 12. Now, if you wanted to reach, you could say, maybe Malos softening up after Rex and Numa absolutely bodied him in the final fight, maybe that could, like, cover the love, the love covereth all sins, or that, you know, the love between Rex and the world, or Rex and Numa covereth all the sins of Logos. Maybe if you wanted to stretch it, however, it honestly feels like Xenoblade 2 was covering the first half, Xenoblade 4 covering the second half. But love covereth with all sins. We have not seen Malos associated with love yet, really. But how could this work? Didn't he die at the end of Xenoblade 2? Well, kind of not really. Remember what was happening to Numa at the end of Xenoblade 2. It's not that she was dying, but she was losing her memories. And through the song One Last You, we learn that she essentially pleaded to Klaus in his final moments to bestow upon her one last gift as a father. Give her some time with the one man she loves. And to our knowledge, because duh, the ending, Klaus managed to abide by that. However, we don't know if that's the only thing he did, but what we do know is that, in some way, form, or fashion, Malos slash Logos, that crystal, makes its way to Xenoblade 3, so it does stick around. It's not that it shatters, or that it does shatter at the end of Xenoblade 2, but it, because of some reason, it is back. At this point, that is not a debate. Maybe it's a bunch of fragments, essentially Elmer's glued together, but we know now that N has the Logos Core Crystal, but specifically that it's Malos. So he is still around. You may be asking, well, how does that work? Well, Takahashi said he can't reveal to us how that happened yet, which implies we're going to get an answer in the future. And I imagine that the best way for that to be told is I don't think in just a spin-off game. I think it's backstory or some kind of revelation that'll happen in Xenoblade 4. Let me cook. I think the main protagonist will either be the fresh new face, either Frank, who I called Mithra's kid, or Logos. Let's assume that it's Logos. Let's assume that it's Malos specifically, but a reincarnated version of Malos. Because I think at the end of Xenoblade 2, I think he lost his memories, faded into that fog. And I think the plot to Xenoblade 4 will essentially be a reincarnated Malos with a fresh slate, unbeknownst to him, all the memories of his past. Oh boy, an amnesia story! Let me cook. It could be an amnesia story, or he undergoes some kind of deep psychological change, some kind of fundamental change in his personality, or some event happens in the course of Xenoblade 4 that pushes him towards the path of good or slash love. I think one of the major struggles of Xenoblade 4 will be, could be the world and the main characters, the main cast of characters essentially trying to overcome this time limit opposed, imposed upon them because of the interlink of the worlds, assuming that is true, that the world's actually interlinked. And if that's the case, I imagine they're all united together in an actual decent world, no longer like Ionios and bound to the strings like puppets, like Mobius had them in, they want to maintain this world, the true world of Lost Jerusalem slash Earth, and that the plot of Xenoblade 4 will be to 
preserve that and find a way not to push back the clock, but to stop the time limit. Keep the world fully reunited. And in doing so, that may come to- that may resort a lot of people to face the sins of the past, and the sins of humanity from the past. And I think for a plot like that, with an overarching theme like that, to try and essentially undo the sins of the past, the selfish, warlike nature that humanity had that led to Klaus eventually, selfishly, separating the two worlds, and essentially proving humanity is better. We have moved on, we have progressed in some way or form or fashion. We may not be perfect, but we're moving in a better direction. If that's the theme of Xenoblade 4, having Malus as the protagonist works like a charm, because that would directly correlate to the potential narrative going on with his character arc. And that Bible passage, Hatred stirreth up strifes, but love coveteth all sin, or all sins. Malos would have to contend with the demons and the sins of his past. All of those he hurt, all of those that got caught up in his own machinations from Xenoblade 2, he would have to contend with all of that. It may not be a redemption story, but again, those sins may never wash away, but you can cover them all up with love. Kind of think along the lines of, say, God of War with Kratos, and the whole story is not that you can completely find atonement, but you can at least choose to be a better person. Even if you won't fully atone for the sins of the past, that is no excuse not to try and become a better person, or try and use whatever position you have right now to do whatever good you are capable of doing. And assuming that Malos is no longer tied to a Malthus, he no longer has that essential imprint that forced him upon the path to begin with from Xenoblade 2. You remove that element and allow Malos the ability to choose for himself fully, without essentially sucking up the nihilism and hatred of humanity from a Malthus, what choice could he make? A Malthus was always the driver for Logos, but what if Logos is no longer bound to a driver? What if he no longer has to have that connection? What if he's allowed to choose for himself, and what if he chooses a better path? And essentially all of Xenoblade 4, at least for him, being about this conflict with himself, and maybe potentially others, to, to try and forge a better path. Think Zuko from Fire, from, not Fire, from Avatar The Last Airbender to some degree, not fully, but to some degree. That's a character arc that could really work with this overarching narrative that I think Xenoblade 4 will usher in because it sounds extremely Xenoblade to me. Like, to me, this is the type of story they would tell. And that's why it makes so much sense to me. Because it just sounds like the type of story and the type of theme they would want to cover. Now, here's where it gets a little bit interesting. Because, technically, you don't have to have Malos be the main character for this to happen. He could be one of the side main characters, right? He could fulfill a role similar to, like, Lan, Senna, Yuni, or Tyon, instead of being the Noah of the main party. In fact, you could have Mithras Kid as the main central pivotal character of the game and have Malos essentially accompany them to some degree. You could have Malos reprise his role as the villain to some degree, and the story is us fighting off against him, and eventually nudging him in a better direction, so at the very end of the game, he chooses a better path. There's a lot of directions this can go, but personally, I think the story works best if he's the main character. It's Monoth, right? They can probably make any iteration or version of this work. Let's be fair here. They probably could. They're that good. But, personally, I would say that Malos slash Logos as the main character works the best in terms of how much development you could give him to really flesh this out and make it unique and not just a stereotypical amnesia story or redemption story. I don't know if they would give him a new form like Mithra turning into Pyra or whatever. I don't know if they would do that. I can't imagine they would just use his form from Xenoblade 2 again. Though, I wouldn't mind that, personally. Could be Malos takes up the role as a teacher to the main character, kind of like a Vandem for the game. We don't know, because, again, we haven't even gotten an announcement for Xenoblade 4, so it's all up in the air right now. But with how much they've talked about and essentially said, Yeah, wait for the future to find out more! Hey guys, we're making more Xenoblade, don't worry. The amount of times they've said this in interviews is actually kind of shocking, by the way. Like, I've actually lost count. I think it just makes sense. I really do. And now, funnily enough, we have seen multiple versions of each of the Trinity Core processes. We had Alpha and A for Antos, as well as Alvis. No, that one gets a little bit, like, you know, nuanced. But yeah, there's been, we had Alpha and A for Numa. Duh, we had Pyra and Mithra. And then we even had Numa. We've only had Malus for Logos. Like, unless they want to keep him special and by himself, they could do another form for him. Another personality, they could do something in regards to that. 
And if we assume that he had his memory basically wiped at the end of Xenoblade 2, or that he's reborn because turns out all you need to do to repair an Aegis Core Crystal is Control c Control v the data from one Core Crystal to the other, Numa, which is basically how he repaired his Core Crystal already, back in Xenoblade 2 in the Cliffs of Mortha. Because remember, how did he repair the damage done by Mithra in the events of Torna? He took the data for, Log for Logos' Core Crystal, he basically took the data he needed from Numa, Numa's core crystal, and while it kind of mentally traumatized her a little bit, it didn't really kill her. Or anything. Pyra even assumed that it would take her memories away, but it didn't end up doing that. And it's not like it was an incomplete form. No, Malus fully completed his task there and healed himself. I imagine if the core crystal itself was entirely shattered, or even more damaged, you would kind of just need a similar practice. Or maybe... Klaus, when he brought back Numa, did something similar for Logos. The interesting thing here is that Monolith have written themselves in such a way to where there's many ways this story can go naturally and still make sense with the confines of the narrative that has been established already. They have multiple ways to go about doing this, if they really want to. It's one of the ways, it's one of the things that makes theorycrafting about it all so much more fun and interesting, because there's so many viable ways that, that this could happen. And the more and more I think about this theory, the more and more it just makes sense to me. That Malos could be a pivotal character, if not the main character of Xenoblade 4. Maybe they give him an entirely new form. But I'm just gonna say this, if we get an announcement trailer for Xenoblade 4 at any point here, you know, within the next three years, and I see anything that resembles purple, I don't care if it's a plant. I'm calling my game, I'm calling my shot. I'm not calling game, I'm calling net, yeah? I'm banking that crap. Boom, Logos. A purple frog? Logos. A guy with a purple scarf? Logos. A guy with Malos' hair? Malos. Anyone uses shadow magic or, like, dark magic or whatever? Malos. If I hear the word indeed, it's over. Yeah, frame one, I'm not calling collect. Could even be the case that instead of what I was talking about earlier with Malos not having a driver in Xenoblade 4, they could give him a new driver as well. Just someone who's, like, infinitely better as a person than a Malthus. Like, that could work. That, that could happen. I mean, it happened f It happened for Numa. Like, she's st like Mithra started, and Pyra started with Adam. But he was never meant to be the true driver of Aegis. He wasn't ready. And because of that, either directly or indirectly, it led to Mithra essentially, well, clapping up an entire continent. Sure, she didn't mean it, but the damage was done. And there's still a redemption story that, that happened there. And that's okay to have. That's an interesting character arc, in my opinion. And Malos is definitely way more far gone than, say, Numa ever was, and he played much more of an active role, but we have seen what a different driver can do for even an Aegis. How much of a difference that can make. Like, that's not a knock on Adam, it's just puzzle pieces that fit together more. Like I said, there's a lot of parallels that could be established here for Malos. And funnily enough, in Xenoblade 3, he still took up somewhat of a villain's role, or at least kind of was forced to in that position. Remember, and originally fought against Mobius. So the Ma so Malos and the Logos Core Crystal was on the side of humanity in Xenoblade 3, at least in the beginning. But he was just the Core Crystal. N, Noah, was the one who willingly decided to join Mobius, not Malos, at least to our knowledge. So while Malos ended up fighting for Mobius, because, you know, N did it, originally he was on the side of humanity trying to break out of the Endless Now. That's a plotline that could be absolutely fleshed out as backstory possibly in Xenoblade 4. Like I'm telling you, the more and more you think about it, the more and more it kind of makes sense. And while there isn't like say necessarily one smoking gun besides, you know, them saying yet in terms of covering how Malos ended up in End Sword. And again, I know some people want to go, but actually it's Logos in there. I'm fairly confident in the art book interview that Takahashi specified that it's Malos, not just Logos. And if that sounds confusing, duh, because we haven't gotten the actual story for that yet. Again, keyword yet. From the sounds of it, they want, they're want they going to tell this story in some way in the future. But I find it so fascinating. I really do. And like, yeah, could it be a, could they trip up and tell a bad story? Yet? They could. I haven't seen them do it yet. Like, I had my faults with Xenoblade 3, but I still love the game to death. And I'm going to love it even more if it does fulfill that role that I thought and wished it did, where it was kind of like working into something greater than just the ending of Xenoblade 3. It's working towards Xenoblade 4, which, and now, I predicted this way back when, but now it's 
every time we get new information seems like that's the case. Does this mean Mel is confirmed to be the MC of Xenoblade 4? No. It's theory crafting at the end of the day. But if I had a pick, I would obviously say new character is the safest bet, but god, in my heart of hearts, I want to say Malice at this point. I love him as a character, he's so cool. Yeah, 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 he kind of like just, he's a villain in Xenoblade 2, but god, I love his interactions with the party. Because even in Xenoblade 2, it's not like he was completely far gone. In Torna he was, but in regular Xenoblade 2, he actually cared about the members of Torna. He cared about Jin. He cared about Arcos, Pachoka, Mikhail. He cared about them. He wasn't a jabroni to them. He treated them with patience, respect, and believed in them and trusted them. One of the main character or main villain that fulfills the role of Malos destroy all of humanity does that. They were clearly, in my opinion, trying to hint at the idea that Malos could be way more than just a villain. And that somewhere deep down inside of them, there's a kernel of compassion, there's a kernel of love. But because of Amalthus, it was covered in sin. But what if in Xenoblade 4, like Proverbs 10:12, instead of that kernel of love being covered in sin, what if now it's the sins of the past covered in love? And with that, I'll call the video there for the day. Thank you all for tuning in. My pleasure for making the video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like and subscribe. It really helps the channel out and helps support future content, and I greatly appreciate it. Stay safe. Have a great day. Go play some video games if you can. Leave a comment down below with your thoughts, your opinions on the Malosphere. Yeah? I'd love to hear your thoughts and hear your opinions, because I'm calling my shot. Yeah? Give me Xenoblade 4, you cowards. Give it to me! Thank you all for tuning in. Stay safe. Have a great day, and I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye, everybody. Until we meet again.